to say just before I start, a big thank you to the organizers, Julia and Michael. I don't know if they're here right now, but uh, maybe they're recording or something. Uh, it was quite hard to get me here, and they really came through. So I just wanted to say, Spasiba. Yeah. <laughs> um, so continuous integration. Uh, do you guys follow XKCD at all? Yeah. Yeah? It's kind of, I don't know if it, it works if you're not a native speaker. It's kind of a weird uh, sort of comic that I get once a day. But uh, continuous integration is uh, automation at its best, and all developers love to automate things. Who, who likes to automate things? We all. All of you. Good. Excellent. Me too. And I've, I've liked automating things for a long time. Uh, ever since I started, well, I got my first computer, I spent a long time uh, connecting my light switch to my computer. So that when I walked into my room, I would hit the light switch and my computer would go on, right? <laughs> but I spent like two days doing that and it saved me, if you have a look on this chart here. It, I did it daily and it took me maybe one second, it saved me one second. So I really should have spent 30 minutes on that, but I spent two days. I mean, I got some fun out of it as well, so. But uh, yeah, this kind of just brings me down to earth every now and then. Um, so, sorry, before I start that. Uh, I'm going to do what I thought was different, but actually I've been watching a lot of your speeches today and they do a similar thing. They tell a story about, uh, everyone here has been telling stories about their experiences, and I really like that it's kind of different. Uh, and it's what I was going to do as well, I thought I was being different, but actually it turns out I'm going to be doing the same thing. Uh, so I've got three problems that I'm going to fix with CI. But just quickly, um, I'm not sure if any, everyone can understand me, I have a very different accent. Uh, I live in Germany, but I'm from Australia, and a lot of people uh, yeah, can't understand me. In Germany, they just sort of nod and go, huh, yeah, hey. And I'm like, yeah, I'm the funniest guy in the world, you know. But uh, anyway, um, if, you, if, you wanna, if you can't understand me or I'm not speaking clearly, just put your hand up and shout at me. Um, so yeah, about me .com, uh, about me, Nick Skelton. If you want to connect with me or have a look at my GitHub or... Anything that I want you to know about me is there, so go and check it out. Uh, a little bit more ego. <coughs> um, these are just some companies that I've, I've helped out in the past. Uh, I've been everywhere from a junior developer to a senior developer, a manager, a team lead, and now I'm a freelancer. Uh, so, yeah, enough about me. Uh, so these are the three problems I'm going to go through. Um, in all the companies where I've worked, I've had these three problems. Without uh, the, any exception, I've always had these three problems. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just sort of tell you about them a little bit, and then I want to find out whether you have these problems as well. I don't know, Ukraine is surprising me constantly, so maybe you guys just don't have these problems at all. I don't know. So the first one is release paralysis. Um, and I just made that word up, by the way. Uh, it's not a scientific word at all. <clears throat> but it happens everywhere. So what happens is you get to the end of your sprint cycle. It's time to press the button and release. And someone finds a reason not to. Usually there's a critical bug or um, you know, a manager isn't quite happy. There's some reason that comes up. Uh, and to be fair, usually it's a critical bug. Uh, usually it's time to press the button and the QA stands up and goes, hey, we found something. And a manager gets scared. He doesn't want to take the risk. And so you don't, you don't release. Does this happen to anybody? Yeah. Yeah. That sucks, right? It's really demoralizing. Okay, I'll, I'll go into that. Um, the second one is messy code, and like there's been several talks today about messy code. Um, but generally, people hate it because uh, what what happens is you have spaghetti code. You can't change one thing without breaking another thing. Um, there's lots of ways to get around that kind of problem. I'm going to approach it from a CI point of view. And the third one is, hey Joes, does anyone know what that is? No? no. I'd never heard of it until the last company I worked out, but they, I thought it was quite funny. Hey Joe is uh, this. So when you're, you're sitting down and you're, you're coding at work, and you've got the best idea, and you're just like, you're in the, you're in the, in the flow, and you, you're just about to like crack like the, the best algorithm you've ever done in your life. And someone comes up to you and says, hey Joe, can you just um, 
do this for me? Can, maybe, can you build another APK? I want to show the new client the, the most amazing feature that you guys have just done. You're like, ah, fuck. You have to like swap branches and, and like create an APK for him, make it happen, and you've been broken. That's why it's called a hey Joe. Uh, <laughs> which I thought was kind of cute, you know. Um, so I'm going to go through these uh, in, the, in a CI context and try to, try to um, fix them within the context of CI. So release paralysis, why can't we ever release? Who, who's heard of the, the five why uh, technique? No one? Surprising. Okay, um, it's developed in Japan, like lots of cool things. Uh, basically it's, you have a problem and you ask why five times to figure out what the root cause of that problem is. Right? So in one particular uh, uh, retrospective, I did this, performed this with, a, with a, a team, and here's what we came up with. Um, why are we skipping this release? Because there's a critical bug, says the QA team. Why is there a critical bug? Well, because we didn't find it until yesterday or the day before. Okay. Why didn't we find it until yesterday or the day before? Well, the developers, the, they, the QA team again, it was introduced late in the sprint, so we didn't have a chance to find it. It's a new bug. You know? Uh, okay, why? The feature wasn't completed until the last minute, so maybe the feature didn't even make it into the, the release until two days ago. Okay, so why was the feature introduced two days ago? And the developers say, it shouldn't be. Okay, so this was, um, this was a problem, so we found out that introducing releases, to, uh, introducing features into the, into the, uh, the sprint two days before the end of the, the sprint was a bad idea. But how can we get around this? And we tried lots of things. Um, uh, QA sprints, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of them. If you hear the word QA sprint, start running. It's a bad, bad idea. But we tried it, it doesn't work. Uh, it's basically a regression to a waterfall, right? Um, uh, what was some other uh, novel ideas? Uh, there's one other, but I can't think of it, I'm, I'm blanking. Uh, anyway, we tried lots of things, and this is what we came up with. This is what we were doing. We were this little cat. You know, everyone loves a cat. GIF, right? It's great. Um, this is what we were doing. We were this cat trying to fix bugs, but another one would come up. And we fixed that, another one would come up. And we realized it was because we were mixing features with bug fixes. Um, but how could we separate them? Well, it turns out there's an age-old methodology that lots of people know about, but no one really uses in the app world. Not directly, anyway. Who, who has a backend in their uh, like uh, product? Their product has a backend. Yeah. Do you have a production environment? Obviously, you have a production environment. Do you have a staging or a develop environment? Yeah. Yeah. yeah these are kind of normal uh, things that the backend teams have. But how many of you have a alpha or a develop version of your app, and then a beta version of your app, and then a production version of your app? Cool, right on. All right, well, you can leave. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, like it, it, it's, it seems like an obvious idea. It's harder to execute, right? Um, so what we did was we did this. We created an alpha, a beta, and a production version of our apps. And we sep started separating our stable uh, changes, which are bug fixes. So when you create a bug fix, you're stabilizing your app. When you put a feature in, you're destabilizing the app, generally, generally speaking. Hopefully you're not, but you know. Um, okay, so who's heard of this? Who's seen this this before? Yeah, cool, right on. Yeah, this was developed a while ago. I'm not exactly sure, maybe 10 years ago. Anyone know that? Six. Six? Six years. 2010, right on. Um, I started using this around 2010, yeah, so that makes sense. Um, and But I, I'm assuming that most people use Git. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, awesome. Git is really powerful with branches. All right, I, I, I don't know if anyone's used Team Foundation Server. That's what I was using before I used Git. Oh my god, I'm never going back there again. Um, we started using this, but we modified it a little bit. We started having, we had a, quite a large team. We had two large teams, an iOS and an Android uh, team. And we modified it a little bit to fit in with our idea. And this is what we came up with. Uh, now it's no... No uh, accident that, I, that we used um, 
uh, Envy's uh, icons and sort of typography there. Uh, because it is really an evolution of what he was doing, just a, uh, an extension. So we developed, we, we have three main branches. Production, which is also master, depending on your naming convention. You have beta, which is sometimes called staging, and alpha. Now, what we did, the blue lines uh, represent uh, the end of a sprint, so a release. And obviously time is moving upwards. So you can see down the bottom, at uh, production, we have 1.6, and then 1.7 in beta, 1.8 in alpha. Pretty normal, right? Um, the only difference is now we are not mixing bugs and features in the same sprint. So uh, hotfixes are in red, so they're, they're actual releases into production. Uh, bug fixes are in the beta, and features are in alpha. So, just to make it a little bit more clear, go through the, the release cycle of version 1.8. So version 1.8 starts down the bottom right hand corner in alpha. We add, let's say, two features. Um, and uh, those features are incubated, so every, every time it, uh, you see a, a pull request being merged back into the alpha, uh, you see these labels that are everywhere. There's a CI job that runs on all three, well there's three CI jobs that are monitoring all three uh, branches. Every time a, a merge happens, a CI build runs, and if it's successful, which in this case it always is, of course, uh, the commit is, is labeled with a label. Um, so 1.8, we go through that. We For that sprint, we add some features, and they're tested also on the alpha. So these aren't just like developers merging back into alpha. Every time a feature is merged back in, the QA team is notified, this feature is finished, and it's ready for testing. Uh, at the end of the sprint, uh, 1.8 moves over to, like basically all three, all three um, branches shift over to the left. So now 1.8 goes into stabilization or beta. Only bug fixes happen to version 1.8, and at the end of the sprint, should be ready for release over into production. And you can see at the top there, uh, I have um, different uh, package IDs, or application IDs as they're now called. Uh, that's no coincidence. That comes next. So how do we implement this in Android? Luckily there's a really awesome way that's been built into this recently. In, in 2010, we were using Eclipse. And this was really difficult. We had we had to go through and actually uh, search for the package IDs and do a search and replace on the build server. This was really nasty. Uh, Gradle makes this really really easy now, and we end up with something like this, my nice unicorn project. So uh, you can see here we have um, three icons: alpha, beta, and shell. This is purely for um, internal use, I guess. So the alpha and the beta are, are not for external use. Um, but it just makes it nice and easy for the testers. So the testers, when they get uh, a notification saying, you know, this feature is ready and it's ready on the alpha, they don't have to uninstall the, the production version, reinstall uh, the alpha version, and so on. It's, they've got three versions of the app, um, and they can pick and choose. And this is done with CI. So let's give you a quick little demo. It's kind of hard to see that, isn't it? Uh, let's do this. Do some cool shit. Right. Now, build types. Who's used build types? I can't see you. Yeah. <laughs> cool, yeah. These are, I mean, they're there, usually. Um, uh, and most projects come with a debug build, at least. You can call them whatever you like. You can create a Moby Tech. No, that is very different. <laughs> okay. What if I zoom out a bit? What the hell? Okay. <laughs> All right, right. Uh, okay, let's just uh, let's forget about the whole zooming thing. Uh, okay, so here we have um, alpha and beta. 
basically whatever you type in here, let's just create, let's say, a Nick, a Nick version. Okay, once you do a little Gradle build, these will appear over here, as you know. Um, the important part, though, is this. You simply have an application ID suffix, and this is just appended to, as, a, as the word implies, appends it to your application ID. Right, really, really simple. So if you assemble the, the debug, it'll add a debug uh, application ID suffix. Uh, alpha and beta, same thing. That's, that's pretty straightforward and easy. The not so straightforward thing, and the rather cool thing, is that you can do all sorts of cool things. You can modify your apps. It's similar to flavors. Build types are not the same as flavors, but they're similar. Uh, you can swap out classes, whole classes. In this case, I've just got some settings in there. But the more important one is is the icon. So I have a different icon. Yeah, what? Who's laughing? The unicorn. Um, and yeah, so the main. This is for production. Really straightforward, right? But really, really useful. Um, okay, that's that's the. Um, Alpha beta production stuff. Um, I'm really happy that I included this because lots of people have been showing what, what cool books they, they read, and uh, no one showed this yet. But I love this book. Who's read this book? Yeah? Man, I, I didn't read it until 2010. And I'd been coding for uh, maybe five years before that and just never read it. It blew my mind. Like, I, uh, yeah. He showed me all the things that I'd seen for five years and then just showed me how to fix them. Really great. Other people have had the same feeling, right? So other people have read this book and other books um, and written uh, whole projects to try to force you to implement these ideas. And here they are, static code anal analyzers. Uh, to, who uses these in their CI builds? Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I, I really cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, Lint comes for free. Uh, like even even in, in Android um, Studio now, if you check in and you use uh, the Git uh, functions inside uh, Android Studio, it'll warn you uh, about any Lint errors before you're able to check in. Right? Really awesome. Uh, but also in your in, in so in Jenkins, I'm going to show you this in Jenkins. It's really really simple. Uh, okay, and then there's copy and paste detection. Who's done this? Be honest, I've done it. Check, like, copied and pasted code and then checked it into production. I've done that before. Long time ago, but I've done it, right? Uh, really simple to implement and very important not to do. Check style is a little bit like Lean, uh, but a little more, um, a little more personal, I guess. You can, you can add some personal touches there. Um, and Sona Cube. Um, has anyone used Sonic Cube? I've seen it uh, uh, on some slides today. It's really cool. Yeah, it's really um, it's serious uh, static code analysis. Uh, I honestly haven't gone too deeply into it, but I would like to. Um, and then unit tests and, and testing. Uh, this is obviously a huge part of CI, uh, but a large part that I'm not going to go into too much detail on because I don't have the time. But uh, UI testing. Um, UI testing in particular, I kind of see that as the 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 uh, the last um, defense line, you know. So if you have if you have clean code and you start with clean code, so I, I've I've worked on some projects where people have UI tests, but they just have the messiest code I've ever seen in my life, you know. And and it's kind of uh, UI tests are really popular right now, especially in Android, uh, and I think it's good, but it's more important to focus on your first line of defense, which is clean code, good architecture, uh, good unit tests that don't even require instrumentation. If you really do your architecture nicely, you can do a lot of, of um, business domain and presenter testing without even instrumentation. Um, anyway, I told you I wasn't going to go too deeply into unit tests. So let's do a demo and let's pray to the gods that um, the internet is working. So here's a, uh, a Jenkins uh, server that I have running uh, for my own personal project. 
Um, so I've, I've sort of made this unicorn app just as a as a demo. Uh, so we have I have three projects: a production, an alpha, and a beta. And these are all pretty much exactly the same. The only difference is that they monitor different uh, branches. So if we just go in here and have a quick look. Uh, I wrote an article on, on how you can install a Jenkins server on an EC2 instance, which is really super cheap, and uh, uh, I recommend doing it. For a long time, I've had my continuous integration build just as a computer sitting on my, on my desk. And that, that's the case in a lot of the places where I've worked. Uh, does anyone do that? Does, do most people do that? Yeah? Yeah. yeah um, the only bad thing about it is that you can't sort of take advantage, especially if you have a, a nasty IT um, uh, section. I don't know another word. Demons. They won't let you punch a hole in their firewall, so you can't implement things like, you can't use things like webhooks, or you basically can't have um, any other system call your web server because it won't be able to get through your firewall, especially if you live in Germany. Um, but yeah, if you put it in the cloud, everyone has access to it, and you can, uh, with a bit of security, you can you can take advantage of this. So I recommend putting it into the cloud as best you can. Um, um, okay, yeah. So alpha, this is the alpha build beta. This is the beta build. And what I'm going to do is just do some really simple uh, changes. So let's go back into here. And where am I? I'm on the alpha branch down here. If you can see that. No, you can't. Anyway, trust me, I'm on the alpha branch. Uh, and I've just got some really simple, badly written uh, tests here. Uh, and these, this one is just testing that these two books are equal, uh, I'm just going to make them fail on purpose. So let's zip out of here. Sorry for the, the whole bright and dark thing. Uh, yeah. So let's see. What? Yeah, just try it one more time. Uh, I'm going to kill the IT guys. That way. Just push it. <coughs> Radical. Okay. Now, let's see if uh, webhooks are working today. Sweet. So, that's the cool thing about webhooks. When you have a, a computer on your desk, you have to constantly poll your your um, GitHub or wherever your repo is. I hate polling, man. Polling's wrong. So webhooks, bang. I just I just uh, pushed. It uh, notifies my build server. The build's running straight away. That's just how things should be. You know. Didn't take me too long to set that up, but I swear. Uh, so that's that's going to be um, a failing test. Uh, let's go and let's do something naughty. Like, uh, well, let's go to a different branch first. Let's go to the beta. Okay, so now we're on the beta branch, uh, and let's just copy and paste this this uh, method here and rename it so that it actually builds. Okay, so very naughty. Don't do this at home, or at work. Cool. Now while that's building, it shouldn't take too long, but I don't have a lot of time, so I can't be just sitting there watching the build server, even though I do like doing that sometimes. Um, I'll show you the last thing. So there was one last problem as we're going, and uh, the last thing that might happen here, depending on, on how this is set up, is um, uh, notifications. So these builds are going to happen, and that's great that, that it's all automatic and the build's going to happen, but it's really important that you get notified. So And the, the right people are notified. 
And Jenkins, for example, is really, really uh, customizable. There's lots of plugins that you can add. Um, although there are two that are missing, a WhatsApp and a Telegram plugin, and maybe a Viber plugin, those are missing, and I want one of you guys to write that. But um, an email one is, is the most obvious one. So an email gets sent out uh, to the right people. So uh, an alpha build, when an alpha build or a beta build uh, completes and is finished, a report should be sent to the QA team. The QA team get it. Okay, cool. Time to time to test this, All right? Uh, and that should pop up. Let's let's see. So long support calls. Uh, this is the third problem. This is the, the hey Joes, basically. Um, so it's something that I, I also saw, not so much these days, but still still it happens quite a bit. But let's just take a quick poll because I like doing that. Who uh, who has a version number somewhere in their app? So like the version name, for example. Yeah, this is like something that a lot of people overlook and people sort of go, yeah, yeah, I'll get to that. We'll, we'll put that in at some point. Really bad idea. So a lot of the support calls, if you've ever worked, who's worked on a support desk before? No one? No. Man, you should, you should do that. You know when you know how when you hear about people like, uh, I don't know, um, McDonald's, for example. So a friend of mine just went to work at McDonald's and he's, a, he's an IT. But the first week of his job, he has to go and work in, in the store and actually give people burgers and be one of those guys, right? Um, I think everyone should spend a bit of time on a, on a support desk because you start to understand um, ways that you can really help them out, you know? And putting a, a version number in your app is such a simple thing to do, but so effective for, for a support call. And not only that, but it, it, um, it helps you as well. So. What happens when the support guys can't fix a problem for a customer? They call the developer, right? Or maybe it's the QA guys, and the QA guys are like, hey, you said that, that this has been fixed, um, but it's not, and you, you argue for hours, and you're like, yeah, I fixed it, it's in the alpha, blah, 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 and they're like, oh, you know, whoops, I just needed to upgrade, you know? The first question that, that, that everyone should ask on a, any sort of support call is, what version do you have, you know? Are you using the beta? Are you using the alpha? Are you using 1.4, 1.3? You know, chances are, this, 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 uh, someone else has had this problem already, and it's been fixed, and there's a fix there. All you have to do is upgrade, and voila, done. It's the easiest support call ever. Um, still, there's some tricks to it. So, um, so here we go. Uh, putting versions in, uh, you, this, this is like a little snippet of, of my app. And I, I even put something in there. I always try to convince uh, product owners to, to do something like this. Not, not just having the, the app version hidden down in some little corner, but like, here's the version number. Here's what to do with it. You know, um, uh, but okay, n knowing that you have the latest version is, is always good. But let's say you can't upgrade for some reason. Maybe the, you got, we've changed the, the uh, version that we're supporting uh, or whatever. The version of Android that we're supporting has changed, so this person cannot go any higher. Uh, but they're still having a problem, and they're an important customer, so you need to fix them up, right? So um, you need to be able to figure out what version they have, and then check out that exact commit in your code. Now, there's lots of, lots of ways of doing this. Uh, the way I like to do it is by labeling, and continuous integration makes this very, very easy. Uh, and there's a little trick. Um, really simple. Uh, does anyone use this already? No? It's really cool. So as you know, like with uh, Android, uh, there's a version code. And everyone knows that the version code has to be higher every time you release. It's really simple. So if your app, the internal app has a just a, an integer. It doesn't matter if you call it 1.4 point blah, 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 blah. As far as Android's concerned, there's just a number. It's version 30. So if you want to install version 28, no, it won't let you. You have to uninstall and then reinstall that. So it's really important that as your app gets older, the version code also goes up. Now, how do you do that? Well, it just so happens that every time you work on your app, the number of commits also goes up. So all this, all this does is it counts 
uh, where you are, so you're in the head on the let's say the end of the alpha branch, and it counts all the all the commits all the way down to your initial commit. Really simple, really great. Unless <laughs> like uh, John was saying in uh, in the previous talk, unless you have a hundred thousand commits, then you might be in a bit of trouble. But for most most guys, this works. Um, yes. So let's have a look. Let's go back. These builds should have finished by now. Good. So the alpha build. Let's go and have a look. That's failed. Okay. Excellent. It's failed because the test failed. All right. Exactly what we want. Really cool. Uh, and the beetle. Let's have a look at that. It didn't fail because it's found duplicate code, but I haven't set that up to actually fail the build. I should, but I haven't. Um, but either way, uh, you can see the details of that here. Highlights the duplicate code. Now, putting this in is really, really simple, but obviously, as you can see, really, really effective. Um, other things like lint issues, I still have a lot in this that I need to fix. I've broken your, your rule, Adrian, I'm really sorry. Um, I shouldn't have checked that in, but, yeah. Sue me! Uh, and that is a wrap. Um, I'm happy to go through, if we've still got a bit of time, I'm not sure. I'm happy to go through um, exactly how I configure uh, these. Is anyone interested in that? Yeah? yeah? Like, right so, on. like seven minutes. Ten, uh, seven minutes? Seven minutes. Okay, cool. Right, yeah. So, let's have a look. So, who uses Jenkins? Does most people use Jenkins? Yeah, cool. I, I only use it because it's free. Uh, a lot of people have asked me already today whether I, uh, what's better about it than uh, Team City or, um, or Travis or whatever, uh, Bamboo. The answer is, I don't know. Um, I'm happy for you guys to tell me that I'm not uh, the smartest person in the world. I'm open to, to hearing, uh, hearing reasons. I just use it because uh, it's what I'm used to. Um, anyway, so build triggers, this is the, the cool part that I was talking about. Instead of having a poll and putting in a cron job here, uh, cron is also cool, but yeah, uh, webhooks is way cooler. Uh, so th this is what actually uh, uh, triggers the build. So uh, GitHub actually calls my Jenkins instance and says, hey, this repo has changed, better update. Um, build environment, nothing interesting there. Uh, so this is actually um, an old version of this of this versioning uh, command that I showed you. It's really, this is what I love about uh, these conferences. Uh, at the first conference that I went to and, and presented something about this, uh, I was using this, and some guy came up to me afterwards and he said, oh, I saw that command that you're using, there's a better one, and this is it. And it is, it's better, right? Um, so this is the old one that I was using, and I changed it. Uh, so doing lint, for example, really simple. Uh, doing lint and tests. So these are obviously tests that don't require instrumentation or uh, an emulator, uh, which, in my opinion, I try to stick to those because uh, an emulator and uh, test farms adds a lot of complexity to your CI build, and you have to set up pipelines and stuff like that. Um, really cool, I guess, um, but I focus on this first and then move to that. Uh, lint, so this just print, this just generates all, all the um, all the, the check style or the static code analysis tools. They generate um, files, uh, XML files generally, and then the plugins just read those files. That's really all they do. Uh, this line of uh, line here, all this does is okay. So back in my build Gradle. Uh, I have this command here that um, this is also something that some someone from a conference showed me uh, that I can actually put the the command into uh, the Gradle file instead of having it. Before I was I would have the build server run this command, inject it into um, Gradle, and then Gradle would again uh, push the version file out uh, so that it could tag. So here this just writes a version. Uh, a tag file just writes a, a simple text file 
this reads that text file and puts it into a, a variable inside Jenkins. Uh, this sucks up that variable. Uh, this is the check style uh, command and copy and paste detection. And here's all the publishing. So then you publish the lint result, publish the check style, duplicate code analysis, and there's a cool plugin that just combines these all together and gives you the nice graphs that you see there. And obviously the chain of test results. This is the cool part. So this is the this is where um, the tagging happens. So if the build actually is successful, then it gets tagged. And the last thing is uploading to Hockey App. There's lots of uh, uh, lots of these distributions uh, systems. Hockey App is just one that I like. Uh, does anyone use anything else? What do you use? Fabric. Fabric. Yeah, yeah, that's a cool one. That's a new one. Twitter's. Twitter's new one. Maybe like Firebase is, is probably going to do something like that soon as well, I reckon. Uh, yeah, Hockey App also does it. The only bad thing about Hockey App is that you have to pay. Paying in Android. <laughs> it's crazy. Crazy talk. Uh, um, yeah, and then there's the, the email. So you can, you can customize the email that gets sent out. You can customize who it gets sent to. Uh, there's lots of cool things you can do with that. Like uh, what it does is it actually reads the the uh, the git uh, comments. The git, uh, blanking on the name. But you know when you, you have a uh, an email and a username, when you uh, check something in, it uses that email and it will, if someone breaks the build, it'll send them an email as well. Yeah, that's, that's all I have in there at the moment. Um, and I think I'm pretty much out of time, right? Any questions? Oh, I'll just leave up. I've got a bunch of links up there to cool things. I'll release these uh, these uh, slides if anyone wants those links. But I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. What's that? Pizza. <laughs> uh, you guys uh, version number and uh, which is uh, related to this number of commits. Uh, what is uh, the uh, fail plan here? Imagine the situation if you have uh, a release branch, a master branch, whatever, the branch uh, which is uh, the source of releases. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have merged uh, like three features inside of it. Okay, yeah. And uh, unfortunately, after some time, uh, uh, there's found one critical. And uh, you have to you have to fall back. So uh, uh, what way do you go with uh, reverting the changes? So with uh, this way, with uh, numbering based on comments, you can't release the previous version. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, and that's happened. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, I haven't done that here, but the way I fixed that in the past is a really controversial method, which um, I think is cool, but some other people don't uh, like it. Um, what I did was I had two builds. So you can see here I've got um, uh, the, master, the master build. So this actually is, this is a little bit different, um, a little bit dangerous. You guys will love this. I don't just upload it to Hockey App, I upload it to Google Play. So it pushes it straight live. Awesome. Um, yeehaw. But, uh, Oh, yeah, you can see that there. Yeah, um, to answer your question, what I do is I duplicate this build and, and, or, and I have it relying. So every time the master build uh, successfully completes a pipeline to another master, and all it does is it, um, it adds two to the version number. So you have, let's say you have version 30 in production. Uh, that gets shipped up there. And then this pipeline version creates version 32. Version 32 is the exact same uh, binary, right? It's, it's built exactly the same way. Maybe you leave out some of the tagging stuff and whatever. Um, but the point is you have a binary now that is like a fallback. And so next time you build version 31, 31 goes in, 
and you're like, oh shit, I gotta take that out. Boom, you've got version 32 ready to go on top, right? Um, it's crazy because um, it's almost like failing. You know, you 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 know, you shouldn't be. Um, it's kind of like putting if if this object equals null. Why is that object null? You know, like don't put if equals null. It shouldn't be null. You know, like so. It's almost like admitting defeat, but it's still a good backup plan, I think. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? I don't buy it. Yeah. Okay, thanks guys. Uh, <laughs> thanks to Nick. Yeah, thanks very much.